everyone. Uh, I am so excited today. Uh, Kara Lucia, president of Nursa Leaders in Collegiate Recreation. Um, I have five amazing colleagues with us uh, while we're going to be navigating our fourth change makers vlog around the concept of sustaining hope and how we use education and research uh, to see that action come uh, to fruition. And so as we've been um, navigating this through the past year, really focusing on uh, looking at the change from the pandemic and the exposure to racial injustice and how we're seeing this action on our campuses as well as within our associations and the impact we can make uh, in the different areas that we find ourselves. Today, I'm excited to have with us Jake, uh, Jarrell, Stacy, Gus, and Anaja. Uh, and to get us started in this conversation, I'm gonna have each of our panelists introduce themselves uh, by saying their name, institution, and something that brings them joy. So as I go around my screen, uh, Gus, how about you get us kicked off? Hey, good evening. My name is Augustus Gus Hallman. I'm an assistant professor at James Madison University. And what brings me joy is hanging out with friends, family, and those that I care about. Thanks, Gus. Jake. Hi there. Uh, honor and a, a pleasure to be here. My name is Jake Eubank. I am the undergraduate program director and assistant professor in recreation education uh, at Lehman College, uh, City University of New York. I'm also the uh, the NURSA director for CAS. Um, and something that brings me joy is uh, traveling, particularly into uh, upstate New York uh, and, and hiking throughout the uh, Catskills and the Adirondacks. Great, thanks. Uh, Jarrell. Hi everyone, my name is Joel Garcia. I'm currently the Assistant Director of Operations at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and currently sit on the Research and Assessment Committee for NURSA. And what brings me joy is spending probably some time with my seven-month-old little baby boy and also training martial arts as a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Awesome, thank you. Anaja. Hi everyone, Anaja Newsom. I am a faculty member at the University of Central Florida in the kinesiology uh, department. Um, I'm also the program education chair for the national conference uh, coming up in Portland this year. And something that brings me joy is after finishing uh, school this past December, I've had the opportunity to just sit and enjoy life with my little kitty and let things slow down. So that has been quite the uh, experience and change of pace for me. Thanks, Anaja. Stacy. I'll just add to Anaja, I just congratulate her on completing her PhD. That was quite an awesome journey and I'm very inspired by her work. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacy Hall and I'm an assistant vice provost for student life at the University of New Hampshire. And what that means is I, uh, my portfolio includes campus recreation, the student union and student activities, along with housing and residential life. And something that I really enjoy is being outside as much as possible, sharing that with Jake in terms of hiking in particular, that's been uh, an activity that my partner and I have pursued quite a bit lately. Great. Well, I am super excited um, for the new connections as well as the opportunities that I've had with some of you to connect over the years. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. We've been focusing a lot on the concept of critical hope, asking daring questions, you know, uh, being curious, stepping into spaces that make us uh, uncomfortable, but getting comfortable with that. And today we're really gonna focus on this concept of sustaining hope. And sustaining hope is learning how essential it is to be able to point to evidence that people's efforts are making a difference. Difference. And when I thought of all of you, I'm like, what a great time and space for people who are educating, conducting research, uh, and valuing that work. And so let's get started with the first question and kind of uh, revisiting this idea of critical hope. So when, um, when we exhibit critical hope, we are more willing to explore sensitive subjects and raise daring questions. How have you spent time exploring sensitive subjects or raising daring questions over the past year during the pandemic, exposure to racial injustice, and the great resignation? Jake, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get us started. Yes, absolutely, thank you, Kara. Uh, I think when thinking about asking these, these types of questions, I, I, I always like to start with reflecting on my own experience and, and my own positionality and privilege um, in my own life, especially during the pandemic and, and thinking about the past two years. Um, I'm a Midwesterner uh, right now living and working in the Bronx, which is the unhealthiest and poorest county in the country. 
Um, there's uh, various uh, inequities and equalities uh, here uh, when it comes to internet um, inequities, access to technology uh, that I've experienced myself. Uh, there's limited access to healthy food, recreational opportunities, um, and uh, really when it comes to recreation and, and fitness, past few years it's really become whatever I can do outside. Uh, if I can, if I have a pair of 10 pound dumbbells, that's, that's what I'm taking with me and, and doing that. And, and growing up as someone that grew up in Ohio, um, I just did not really grow up with these types of injustices um, that, uh, that individuals that were born and raised here uh, have, have experienced. And I try to take that in with me into my role as an educator uh, here at Lehman College. It's a Hispanic serving institution. 80% of our students are African-American or Hispanic. 57% uh, are first generation. 50% are non-traditional. Uh, half of them are below the poverty line. And 60% of them reside here in the Bronx. Uh, so it's a very uh, unique um, student population that we have here. And um, many of our students uh, the past two years have lost their jobs due to the pandemic. Uh, we're essential workers in the healthcare field who may have lost family members, friends, and coworkers. Um, multiple generations living under the same roof. Um, and even when I'm when I'm teaching in the virtual environment, I've had students attending class uh, virtually from their bathrooms or their closets, their uh, hallways of their apartment buildings, um, just anywhere they can find that that uh, little corner where they can find some some privacy. So taking that into account, sometimes in my experience, you know, during uh, when I was conducting classes uh, is simply asking how they're doing and allowing them uh, that space to share their experiences with me and with each other. Uh, because sometimes it's, it's the only time that they have to, to share that experience. And, uh, and oftentimes that, that is what makes up our entire class period. And, and sometimes that's, that's what is absolutely necessary uh, in order to, to have those difficult conversations. And just lastly, just as, as my leadership position as program director, uh, looking at the, the impact that uh, the past two years has had on our uh, faculty members, particularly our part-time instructors, um, who some, some have lost their full-time positions, which made them rely more heavily on their income from the college. Um, some struggled severely with, with teaching online and making that conversion, which resulted in, in uh, you know, us full-time uh, faculty members really stepping into that mentorship position to help them navigate the online learning uh, platforms. Uh, and lastly, really just like all the other higher education institutions in the country, um, CUNY's messaging about budget shortfalls, budget cuts um, has, has not really set a lot of their minds at ease and, and led some very difficult conversations. When, and when we're thinking about the great resignation, um, we, have, we have really felt that impact uh, here at Lehman College as well with uh, leading uh, a lot of our part-time and full-time faculty to move on from their positions. And so looking at that from, from my own lens uh, and, and my own life experiences uh, has, has really, uh, you know, caused me to, to think about uh, things and ask those difficult questions and have those, have those difficult conversations. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, it's really interesting how we how we have to navigate and step into that space of uncomfort and uh, just the the ability of you sharing kind of the self awareness of your own personal lens and then how you have incorporated learning from your students and uh, the individuals within your community, be it your campus community as well as the community that you live in in the Bronx. So thank you for that. I'll I'll jump in um, and because Jake said something that was really um, profound for me um, as someone who actually left there career, you know, what, what had been my, my career, my kind of identity for more than a decade um, and transition during this time. I think that the pandemic has forced a lot of us to create space or be in a space where we had to reflect on our own values and our beliefs. And I think one of the biggest things that came up um, is context. I think that when we're, when we're educating and when we're doing research, I think context is such a big um, element now and something that we have to take it um, take into consideration when we're doing 
research. Um, I'm, I'm a numbers person. I'm, I'm very objective data where it didn't happen. Um, but I think that, you know, over the last two to three years, we've had to ask ourselves, well, in what context did this occur and, and what was the environment? And I think that's so important as we um, look to sustain this critical hope is really um, adding that element of context and, and understanding that there is, there's more to people, there are more to humans than what we see in the office or what we see in the classroom. And I think that one, we have to acknowledge that, but two, we have to seek to understand that. Um, and, and as a researcher, my lens has, has broadened and to appreciate context, um, both as a researcher and as a leader. Um, contextual leadership is gonna be so important as we uh, look to sustain that critical hope. Great, Anaja. Thank you for that. Stacey, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, you know, Kara, I really appreciate how you, you frame this question because you're really challenging us to really think about our own actions, particularly during this challenging time of navigating through the pandemic. And it got me to reflect on how I've spent some time. And I was invited by a colleague across campus to join a small group of women in a book club, which I've never, I don't think I've ever in my career done a book club before, but it was different folks from across campus, all that identify women, but all our other identities were all um, pretty different. And so we started with Dr. Kendi's work and had, we met every week and we had such good in-depth discussions that we decided to continue. So we read CAST and we read a couple other um, and it lasted, I think, at least a year together, every week. And the part that, in addition to the work and learning, each of us learned different things from that experience. But I also remember that every uh, there were a lot of weeks that the hour leading up to the time we were scheduled to meet, I would think, man, I am so drained, or I don't know what adjectives to use, how we <laughs> describe our experience the last year that sometimes I felt like, I don't know if I could contribute to this really important discussion that you really need brain space to be an effective contributor for. But what I found was I still went and still participated. And each time I was amazed at the conversation we could still have. And sometimes we needed to support each other for whatever we were dealing with on campus. Um, and also talking about the, the readings that we had. And it reminded me of, the last vlog that you had with Paul Wesselman about that reciprocity of support that resonated with me. And I felt like I experienced that of how we support each other through these different experiences. Um, it's one of those things that I value the most of NERSA too, is the colleagues and the relationships that we develop really help us through and um, going through the pandemic and also Work, all the work that needs to happen around um, equity and diversity, it's its us working together that's going to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate you talking about the reciprocity of that support. You know, we, when, um, you know, as we talk later on, we'll probably see this emerge a lot. This idea of sustaining hope is, you know, how we breed hope in others. And this idea that there may be days where, uh, you know, I might be showing up to a space tired after meetings, teaching, working, whatever it might be. And then uh, this ability to actually receive hope by listening to what other people are doing, the action that they're doing that creates this opportunity to be inspired by others. Right. And us being able to lift each other up um, maybe on days of, of needing rest or <laughs> celebration of, of the small accomplishments and the appreciation for the patience that we might need. And so as we kind of transition to the next question, uh, exhibiting critical hope is all about action. And so we're taking this action and while sustaining hope is pointing to this evidence that people's efforts are making a difference. So if we could spend some time to talk about maybe where you've seen this show, show up on your campus. Uh, so I'll turn it over uh, to Jake or Gus to get us started on this one. Jake? Sure, I can go, sure. Um, yeah, so I, I really appreciated this, this question because um, it kind of allows me to, to really look at um, us at Lehman College, uh, you know, things are a little bit different than, than a lot of uh, universities that are in the rest of the country. We actually just opened campus back up in fall last semester, fall 2021. Um, and even then, in-person classes were, were quite limited to, 
students doing master's theses and, and uh, courses that require lab work. Uh, and so um, before then, campus was completely closed and I, I didn't even see my office for uh, a year and a half. And um, so with thinking about that, is it's really interesting. We're, we're just now seeing a lot of our students come back on campus. Uh, my office is right above the basketball courts in, in the building. And, uh, and so on a daily basis right now that those basketball courts are filled um, much more than they even were before the, before the pandemic. Um, and so just, just seeing, having that space for them um, to come in and, and ha have somewhere to enjoy an activity with each other, I think is, is just that evidence that, that we are seeing uh, those actions um, making a difference. And, um, you know, and with, with research, uh, a colleague of mine, right when the pandemic hit, uh, we started collecting data on, on uh, perceived stress of faculty and students uh, here at Lehman College. And, and what we saw over that first year was faculty stress actually went up uh, and student stress started to come down um, throughout that first year. And I think that's a, a lot due to the support systems that our higher education universities put in place. Um, you know, here at, at Lehman, we, in, we instituted a tuition debt forgiveness program, um, laptop loaner programs, a food pantry for the surrounding community, um, online education training for both our, our faculty and students um, to try to, to provide some kind of support to, uh, to students that, that might be struggling quite a bit. Um, and I, I think our own efforts as, as program directors and instructors um, by practicing that empathy and, and flexibility, you know, although we have in-person courses, um, many of our students are still very uncomfortable coming to class. And, and so practicing that empathy and, and really trying to put ourselves uh, in, in, in their shoes and um, maybe accommodating those students a little bit with converting our class to that high flex uh, format where we just have them on Zoom on our, on our computers in class and, and they can still join in that way. Um, and providing opportunities for growth uh, in a changing landscape. Um, our curriculum has changed due to the changing students' needs um, and infrastructure uh, improvements on campus uh, have really come underway and, and students are really um, really seeing that. And, and you can see that in their optimism and their, and their resilience um, as they come back to campus. Thanks, Jake. Gus, did you have anything to add in relation to kind of the action that you've seen on campus? Yes. Um, going off of a quote that a colleague provided to me, and it was related to how can I support you? And the, the response was just keep it simple. I don't need to make this a complex process. You just need to keep it simple and try to move forward. And so with that quote in mind, um, I attended a training that looked at uh, trauma-informed pedagogy uh, as far as designing your syllabus and your class structure. And this helped shape my ideology about what students are really experiencing on campus these days. And how can I be a, a voice of change or support as they are navigating uh, academia and life on college campuses this past fall and spring? And that forced me to take a step back and ask myself as an instructor or a teacher, what are my goals in the classroom? What are my goals with supporting the students? And so I made it a point just checking in with the students. Sometimes I have to let them know, when I ask you, how are you doing? It doesn't help you if you tell me you're fine, because if you're not fine, it, I can't, I don't know. And so I can ask, how are you doing? And everyone will say, fine. And then I put an assignment up and say, okay, it's due tonight. And they say, no, I'm not fine. I got a lot of things going on. And so um, these types of um, situations, these types of discussions help us to really acknowledge the trauma that we are experiencing, um, navigating COVID, navigating everything else that we, that has impacted us emotionally, physically, socially, uh, and conceptually. And so once 
you get to the point of just acknowledging, yes, I do need help. I do need support. Don't make it complex. Just support how you can. And that could be in a variety of different ways. Thank you guys for that. I, I like the theme of how we're seeing this show up on the academic side, student affairs side across the university campus when we think about just, you know, our roles and well-being and whose responsibility is it. I was just talking to seniors in my course today and we were talking about whose responsibility is it. And so we have positions designated, but when we really think about these opportunities for integrated well-being and how that goes to help sustaining, sustaining hope. So another question, you know, um, Many times we like to just do a lot of talking or disagreeing and not asking questions and listening <laughs> to each other as we're navigating challenging times. And sometimes in our in our closer environments, maybe our homes or the people we're closest to at work, we don't do this as well, right? Because we can show them our, our true selves sometimes. But how do we, how do we, um, can we describe like a time over the last year where one of you learned something new by listening to others speak of their pro their progress of addressing uh, injustice. Jake, do you want to take I, that? One? Yeah, absolutely. I I am actually very excited about this question because I I just had a conversation with a student um, who I had her in, in class before the pandemic happened, and it was my first time talking to her. Um, you know, as we enter this recovery phase, uh, and this student is uh, a wheelchair bound student, um, and uh, and she was kind of reflecting on uh, and telling me her story and, and her experiences here at uh, here at Lehman and in and, and class and even throughout the, the city of New York. Uh, uh, and um, she really pointed out uh, quite a bit, quite a few things that uh, that were very much a, a learning uh, experience for me uh, because uh, she had issues with access to campus um you know leaving our campus is somewhat of a closed campus we have uh, we have gates uh surrounding the perimeter and um only a, a few of those gates are, are wheelchair accessible and they're not always open and so when she would come to to come to class um sometimes she couldn't even get onto campus and if she did get onto campus sometimes the elevators weren't working so even if she did get onto campus she couldn't uh you know attend class because some of the classes are on the second floor and she couldn't there was no way for her to get up there uh and so that was that's really eye-opening when when you kind of uh have that lived experience with that person and and hear of the, those those struggles that um you know we take for granted in in everyday life and uh they're very eye-opening and she even talked about uh experiences that she had in class of, of isolation um, and the attitudes and the perceptions of that other students had uh, where she felt excluded, uh, you know, during group work or um, she, you know, some of her ideas were, were, were dismissed or students acted dismissive towards her. Um, and she even told me about a, a study abroad trip that she went on uh, where they had assured her that the hotel that the students were staying at uh, was wheelchair accessible. And by the time they got there, uh, she found out it wasn't. And essentially what had happened was they ended up putting her uh, miles away in a hotel uh, of much less quality. Uh, and she had a, a very jaded experience uh, during that study abroad trip. And, and really just, just hearing that for me uh, and, and hearing those struggles was, was very eye-opening and um, a very, very big learning experience uh, and, and uh, you know, just not even just students with disabilities, but just hearing, you know, the, the daily struggles that that individual students go through and and trying to relate to them. And and uh, and a lot of times students just want to be listened to uh, and, and heard and those struggles heard. Uh, and so that 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 was one experience that was that was very eye opening for me. Yeah, well, I, pre I appreciate you sharing that because it's a really great tie into the next question. You know, mm -hmm. um, if I think about if I think about Kara Lucia from 10 years ago on her DEI journey, I am definitely as this white woman born in the southern part of Virginia, a completely different person. And even if I went back 20 more years, I'll call myself out 
All right. In the mid forties. All right. <laughs> and, but this journey of my own, my own personal journey of education, the people that I've had the opportunity to learn from, um, but knowing that I'm still going to make mistakes because I'm still learning. And then what do I do after I've, I've maybe misstepped and, and how do I, how do I listen and, and take, um, uh, take some feedback so that I can learn and, and continue on this journey and continue to progress. And so, um, this next question, uh, you know, when we're engaging in DEI work, anti-racist work on our campuses, uh, within our association and other places, there's a lot of learnings that, ha- that, that can happen. So how do we help others with the idea that failure might actually lead to a, a new idea, a new learning that occurs for personal and professional growth? So I'm going to turn this over to Jarrell to get us started on this one. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I, I naturally think back to martial arts on this one of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, which also applies to yoga, but many aspects of life, you know what I mean? Um, there's gonna be a variety of type of uncomfortable conversations, topics, situations that we may find ourselves in throughout life. But in those uncomfortable areas, that's also where growth happens. That's also where progress happens. So it's be giving ourselves the permission to be uncomfortable, but also on the opposing side, being able to uh, acknowledge the challenge or the uncomfortability that someone may be facing when they're bringing up a topic or bringing up a question, right? And that kind of goes back to something that Anaja said of like seeking first to understand, right? So our when we're having these difficult conversations, especially when it's a very passionate conversation or dealing with diversity, equity, inclusion, and all these critical conversations, it's very easy to make them get emotional very quickly because it's tied to who we are as people at the end of the day, whatever we may be talking about. Um, but being able to take that step back and seek to understand where this person may be coming from in their uncomfortability, right? If you're uncomfortable, you may um, freeze, you may fight, you may run away, right? Um, and, and it's giving them that um, environment to do so and understanding it so that they can continue to be in that uncomfortable conversation and continue to get that exposure because there's the idea that exposure leads to expansion, Right? Being exposed to these ideas, being exposed to different people and different outlooks will lead to this progress. You know I mean, so it's a level of first allowing yourself to be uncomfortable, allowing yourself to potentially even be wrong, allowing yourself to challenge opinions that may have been embedded in you when you don't even get to actually choose them, if you will. Um, and then once people are doing that, also seeking to understand where they're coming from instead of uh, saying why a piece of them may be wrong. Right? So I think that's really, really huge when we talk about these critical conversations. And um, there's a guy named uh, Daryl Davis, who's a musician by trade, but author. And um, he's known for uh, de-hooding like hundreds and hundreds, literally over 500 uh, KKK members. And this is a black musician from the South. Right? And he has really sat down with these people who his big question that he learned, unfortunately, when he was 10 years old was, how could these people hate me if they don't know me? And as he grew up, he literally sat down with these people and he's been responsible for personally de-hitting hundreds of these members by once again, sitting face to face with someone who in all likelihood should hate them, should hate him, right? And having conversations. So um, see, seeing that type of extreme case um, makes many of the things that we're trying to progress um, seem so much more palatable, if you will, and so much more um, digestible and so much more within our reach, even though they can seem so far away when we're looking at the grand scheme of things. So. Jarrell, um, I, I really appreciate that story. That's something that I want to look into um, a little bit more. So I'd love to, to, to chat with you a little bit more about that. That um, kind of leads into what, what I came to when I, when I heard this question or why I was thinking about this question. And, and the first thing that came to mind was be the example. And sometimes um, we have all, all of these different intersectionalities. Um, we identify as a lot of different things. And so there is no person, no individual that has the same lived experiences. And so what I, what I found myself reflecting on is that there have been different injustices, different conversations, different critical conversations that, you know, could have been offensive to me or could have been offensive to the person sitting next to me. Um, and we can choose to build a fence um, when we take a fence, or we can choose to keep that fence open and really listen and dialogue. And I think that I have friends and colleagues and 
um, that, that choose to build that fence. And I, and I think that that's where the communication gets lost. That's where the learning gets lost. Um, and so one of the things that I've chosen to do is be the example of how to face those tough conversations. And, and sometimes it's not that it's not hurtful. Sometimes it's not that it's not uncomfortable, but choosing to be open and choosing to hear others when they are in a place of vulnerability to me takes a lot of bravery. It takes a lot of courage. Um, but I think the end result, the outcome of that leaves us in a, a place to be hopeful about progress and about change. Um, and so I found myself having a lot of difficult conversations um, that made me uncomfortable, that that kind of made me cringe a little bit. Um, but I but you you have to be a good judge of character and understand that, you know, when a person is, is truly trying to learn and trying to grow and trying to understand and, and express their own experiences. And um, by you hearing that and, and offering that space, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make you any less of a, of a, a human or a person. And I feel like I've, I've met those folks who like, if you don't stand up and if you don't you know, put them in their place. And if, you know, you're not angry because they, they made that misstep or that mistake, then, you know, you're, you're not, in my case, you're not as black. You're not, you know, if you're not putting that foot out there because someone made a mistake, it, you know, cancel culture became something that really like it, it I, I feel like it kind of shut the, the doors to conversation over the past two years. And, and I really just, want it to be an example of how you can sit in your own discomfort and in the greater effort of helping others learn and allowing others to be vulnerable. Um, and I'll end with this. I had a conversation who's with someone who's a, a really good friend of mine. Um, and over the past six years, we've had a couple different conversations, a couple different run-ins where there was some miscommunication there. And and at the end of every conversation, I, I kind of felt attacked. I kind of felt like, okay, where is this person coming from? And it was shortly after um, the George Floyd murder that this person finally got it. And they came back and they reflected on all of the, the times that we'd had these miscommunications. And it, they, you know, they were very thankful and grateful for the opportunity to have those mistakes and still have someone that, you know, respected them as a person and understood that it was not intentional. Um, it was lack of knowledge and lack of understanding and to still respect them as a professional and as a colleague and as a human um, as they learn. And so I think that being an example of a space for vulnerability is so important right now. And it's not easy to do. I want to acknowledge that it's not easy, especially when you're the person feeling like, how, how is it that you don't understand this? How is it that you don't know how this is making me feel? And, and it's, it's easy to kind of build that fence. Um, and it's much, much harder to stay open and, and create that space for others when, when you're the person that's uncomfortable. I really appreciate uh, Gerald's and Anaj's, uh, you know, your your reflection on on uh, recognizing that uh, you know we all make make mistakes, and I, I think uh, in my experience, um, you know, in, in having these hard conversations is not assuming that uh, that when somebody makes a mistake or makes a misstep, that it is meant as uh, you know malicious or um, or disrespectful. It, it just, you know, so, sometimes people just don't have experience or they, you know, they just don't have that understanding. And th that kind of takes me back to my experience as a student affairs administrator. Uh, when I would always tell my students, you know, I screw up every single day. And, um, and it's about what you do uh, after that. And and the learning moment that that you seize when that when that occurs, and um, that really kind of drives home and, and being courageous in making mistakes, and and, and those, that is required to to move forward and acknowledging that you're not perfect and and that no one knows everything, and um, and encouraging people to have these these hard conversations in in those in those spaces of, of vulnerability and, uh, and open-mindedness. One, if, if I, one thing that I want to kind of add to what Jake just said is that 
I think that if you are in a position to listen and learn, I, in my role, I've actually been able to listen to understand where the learning needs to happen. I think sometimes mm-hmm. when you when you are immediately on the the the, the defense, you don't understand where the learning actually has to happen. And it may not be at the point of your conversation. It may be several steps before that in which the the misstep actually happened or the communication actually happened or the learning needs to occur. And I have, I I developed a workshop on um, how to make fitness and wellness anti-racist. And it was based on some conversations and some learnings that happened that on the surface were just very combative, um, but, but when you actually take a moment to press pause and listen, you can understand where the experiences need to change in order to create that education and to create that learning. And I think that's really, really important, especially when we talk about personal and professional growth. And, and to add on to that, because all of the points made thus far are excellent points. And so being uh, providing a context at the end doesn't do it justice, but I will try to wrap everything up that was said, because um, I'm not going to rehash what was said, but as we are having these dialogues, I have in the past week been reading the Book of Joy, and this book was in a discussion between the Dalai Lama and um, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu, and when you listen to their dialogue and how they take laughter or joy from the mistakes they made and how that helps them to grow, it gives me a a sense of hope that we can move forward in these discussions because sometimes it is a a mistake and a miscommunication, understanding where everybody is coming from, or maybe trying to engage in the discussion at uh, at a different point or different points, and so that leads to confusion. But there's still opportunity that we can rebound from that and have a uh, intellectual discussion about what's going on or try to move forward. Mistakes will happen, but the point is to learn from our mistakes, acknowledge our mistakes, and then try to move forward and having a healthy communication. If we just shut down that communication, we're not able to get to a deeper dialogue. And that deeper dialogue is how things move forward, how we progress with our knowledges, our experiences, and so forth. Thank you, Gus. Yeah. You know, and I was just thinking about this. I was on a call the other day and we're talking about language, right? Language is something that changes all the time or the cultural context in which we find ourselves in. And so there's still moments where I may be having an educational opportunity just to learn some new language around DEI and anti-racist work. The other part too, I think that's so interesting is the spectrum of where people find themselves in that journey. So when we think about critical hope and forms of action, that action from an educational perspective could be I am learning what DEI is. Tell me, what is diversity? What is equity? What is inclusion? And I don't understand. Like, let me know. And then others are, okay, now they're ready to be courageous and step into the space to create a program, to create something. And so where's that, yeah, where's that opportunity to maybe misstep, but to learn. So that way we do have that progression and people um, stepping up and feeling empowered to be in those spaces. So as we think about that, and so you you all have already done an amazing job of sharing examples of where this is showing up for you in your work life and personal life. Um, But if we can have you all share a little bit about how this shows up in your work. So at research or professional development, educational opportunities, uh, where have where have you been involved or seen others contribute to powerful impact of positive change? And how have you engaged others to join? So, uh, Daryl, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Um, so professionally speaking, um, more recently, um, I started to chair a uh, student application work group for a hiring for all of our students in our, across our whole entire department. So we employ upwards of like 700 students across our whole entire department. So very, relatively speaking, a very large department. And I'm big on research mind, uh, database decision making, right? Um, but when it comes to database decision making, while yes, I do gravitate towards the numbers, Numbers don't tell the whole entire story, like Anaja perfectly said earlier, right? So when you're doing, uh, even whether it's, even if it is a quantitative study, you still have to make inferences, which tell more of a story that the numbers itself may not be telling or having to make an inference based off what the numbers are showing, right? So sharing the student application work group, we're looking at our hiring 
practices, procedures, and our outreach practices and procedures. Right. So, for example, a thing that was brought up in our initial meeting, and it's not only professional that, it's also students, was one of the students felt like our department wasn't diverse. Right. As a relatively broad statement, it wasn't diverse. So I asked her, like, oh, what does that mean? Does that are you speaking just for your program area? Are you speaking as a department as a whole? Are you speaking as um, how our website or the interaction that people have on a daily basis? What does that mean to you? And it opened up a really deeper conversation beyond that just surface level of we need more diversity, right? Or we need to be more inclusive and went down a little bit deeper of going, where how are we doing our outreach? How are people interacting with our uh, department when we are posting our applications? Um, and if we're not collecting data on that, which ties back into the data piece, if we're not collecting data on that, it's hard to see where we can make improvements and make progress, right? So being able to see that, let's say 60%, this isn't the case, but 60% of everyone who works in our department were referred by a friend. Well, if our population within our department is only of one demographic and people tend to uh, socialize with people that are similar to them, well, then that's just going to continue to problems. So it's going, okay, do we need to change how we're doing our outreach, doing it in different types of ways to make sure that we're actually reaching out to all the different populations that are within our campus? Um, but once again, not just going off the statement of, hey, I don't feel like we're deserved the first enough that's going, are we providing that opportunity? And not only the opportunity, but um, being open with it. And what I mean by that is, um, this kind of puts it on my, my director, but it's, I, I, it's a very important story and I like to tell the story about him. Uh, we, I think it was like two or so years ago, we had a department retreat and he said, everyone write down three things you love about working in this department and two or three things that you wish could be more. And communication was something that everyone wanted to see improved from like top down. And he was really kind of taken aback by this. And he's like, I don't understand. I always have my door open. I tell people I have an open door policy. Why, why is that? And I had to tell him, it's like, just because your door is open doesn't mean that people feel welcome to walk through it, right? So it's, what are you doing beyond us just posting an application, beyond us just putting a statement that say we value diversity, inclusion, and equity? What are we doing beyond opening our doors to make people truly feel welcome to step through it? Okay? So with this committee, we're starting to do the work, one, from a data side, but also with these conversations. Um, to not only make sure that we have all the doors open that we want to make sure are open, but are also making sure people feel comfortable to actually step through them. Um, so yeah, so I think that's a big thing that we're currently working on. To add to that, some of the work that I've been involved in um, has been research focused and it has informed my teaching practice. So currently I'm teaching a programming class at the university. And one of the things that I really focused on with teaching the programming class was getting my students out into the community to run programs. And my uh, focus on getting them out into the community to run programs is not only to provide a community program, but the hope is that by it being in the community, it serves a social good. The reason I want them to do a program for social good is that it's not about making the money. It's more about how can we provide communities with resources and opportunities that will be beneficial to those constituents. Now, the students, they may see it as just another assignment, but what they fail to realize is that the people they're interacting with may see it in a different light. They may see it as that opportunity to encourage them to go to college if before no one has spoke that into their life. And it gives them that opportunity to um, enjoy Easter by having an Easter egg hunt because th that's not something that they would have access to before. And so tying that into this trauma-informed ideology, understanding that people are gonna have different lived experiences in all of these different spaces without telling students that they are addressing that need I'm having them and hoping that they are able to engage those communities and support them in their time of need. When I look at research, I see that the research piece can really answer some of those questions about what is really happening and how can we support our students and community members? What, what needs do we have? And going back to that first statement that I made earlier, just keep it simple. 
sometimes just answering the research question and understanding that keeping it simple will address the issue. Um, I'm not saying it's always going to be perfect, but um, it, it does lead to a lot of uh, uh, gains in the future. Thanks, Gus. So I know uh, we're, we're getting some limited time, so we're going to try for two more questions. So I'm going to mix it up a little bit for my panelists here, so they'll have to pay attention. Uh, uh, but you all, many of you were talking about this idea of collaboration, you know, just the interest in this collaborative work. And so uh, why is collaboration important when it comes to providing educational opportunities that contributes to positive change? So why, yeah, why, why do we need to just not do this in a silo or by ourselves? Stacey, you want to start us off with that one? Um, sure, Kara. Uh, I think collaboration has always been a critical component of us successfully accomplishing our work. And what this question triggered me to reflect on is something that I've been thinking about even before we started talking about doing this group discussion today. And that is how the pandemic has influenced our students and the experience level that our students are at right now, particularly those who are traditional age college students. And as I'm seeing some trends that are gonna force us to revisit our collaborations to change our work. And what I mean by that is we're seeing more students, a higher percentage of students requesting to live in single rooms than in the past. And I'm seeing requests from students that want, they're, they're not comfortable or not ready to have a conversation with people on their like residence hall floor to say, hey, who wants to go to dinner tonight? What they'd rather have is an individual bus come and pick them up at the time they want and take them there by themselves. So I'm hearing them describe these very individualistic experiences they want to have. And so when I think about the challenge that we've already faced before the pandemic in helping our students learn to talk with each other is that that is going to be an even big, bigger barrier. So how do we how do we work together across our campuses to help our students learn how to have conversations? Because their anxiety about talking to another person, especially in person, is really real. And I'm not sure what that looks like yet, but it, it's, it's going to, we need to really think about our work and, and trying to meet our students where they're at to help them grow, to be able to do this work. And I think about how that affects DEI conversations, which can be, like we talked about earlier, you're, it's an uncomfortable conversation. So if you're not even comfortable saying who wants to meet for dinner, <laughs> like how do we have get them confident enough to have an even more challenging conversation? And that's such a great uh, point, Stacey, and that, that social piece. Um, and I think over the past years, it's probably been one of the biggest things that I think has been brought to so many people's attention is how important that social aspect is. And when it comes to college campuses, it's, I think it's really critical for each of us and within all of our positions, it's seeing the value in each aspect of the college experience, right? Seeing the value in the environment that our students are living and interacting with, seeing the value in the education that they're getting, both formal and informal, seeing the value in the physical opportunities that they have, such as recreation or fitness. Um, but as we talk about wellness, uh, thinking of nurses, we think of wellness as not just the uh, intellectual piece, the intellectual, the social, environmental, physical, financial, professional, it's all those pieces. And if we value each of those pieces, that's where true collaboration can come from, right? Because I want to collaborate, you want to collaborate and you're encouraged to collaborate with someone that you value, right? So if we're able to Sometimes you can put down our own ego of like, we can handle everything wellness, um, but put down, or we can handle everything education, we're, we're the professors, right? Um, and seeing it as wellness is once again, this well-rounded uh, multivariant piece that impacts our students because they can be doing very well in class, but be struggling with their social circle. They can have a strong social circle, but be struggling with their financial stability and having these larger conversations that aren't so um, unilateral, but once again, more well-rounded and bringing in um, professors into the student affairs section and bringing in housing and dining into um, the uh, physical plans and facilities conversations, bringing in all these resources and by resources, I mean people um, 
to come together and understand that we all play a role in level of comfort for our students, in the student who's in a wheelchair, in the student who is a first generation student, uh, in the student who's away from home, because that plays into, once again, their level of comfort in the physical, intellectual, environmental, social, um, physical aspect of their development as people overall uh, on our campuses, so. Um, you bring up some great points and I, I think in order for us to understand what those needs are, one big piece of this collaboration has to, to do with expanding our reach and expanding um, the folks that we are talking to and then bringing, bringing to the table when we decide um, on resources and, and programs. Um, largely, the reason that I got into research and assessment was understanding the perspective of the students that we are not reaching. Um, so when we send out our program evaluations and we send out our Forrester reports and things like that, the folks that are, are filling out the, the surveys pre uh, predominantly identify as women, pre predominantly identify as not having a physical disability. Um, and, and that unfortunately does not um, represent our entire population. Um, and so I'm, I always look at the collaboration between research and um, practice as a needed opportunity to understand who's not, whose voice is not being, uh, being heard, who's not filling out our surveys, who's not coming to the table. Um, even when you read a lot of research and assessment, the first thing I do is look at the demographics. Who, whose story am I hearing? And largely it's, it's less than 10% minority. It's, it's, you know, the Forrester report for three years, there were it was less than seven percent minority identifying students and 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 yet so many recreation programs wellness programs are using the data from this to justify their their programs and i'm not saying that's wrong but i'm saying that there's there's collaboration that needs to happen so that we can reach those students who are not looking for us um, the people that are filling out the survey are the ones coming onto campus looking for wellness resources they're they're looking for that that assistance and they're seeking us out to fill out fill out our survey but there's a there's a demographic of student that is not and that demographic looks different on every single campus and and I'd like to challenge our colleagues and our friends to really understand what that looks like on, on our campus so we can get those folks at the table. Mm -hmm. Just acknowledging that a lot of the groundbreaking changes that we've seen has had a collaborative effort in their way of being uh, molded or shaped is something that gives me um, a positive perspective on the use of collaboration. I don't know everything. My colleagues here know certain things that I don't know. And so being able to connect with each other leads to a lot more positive change than if I just try to do things on my own. Thank you, Gus. That's a great tie into my last question. So I just anything that any of either one of you want to share about just sustaining hope, breeding hope in others, or a resource for hope, maybe a resource you already mentioned um, as we wrap up. So what's that little piece of, of hope that you'd like to leave with the group today uh, in relation to this journey of sustaining hope through education and, and research and love the idea of applying it to practice? So I can uh, kind of chime in then. Yeah, for, for uh, so I, the saying goes, a goal without a plan is a wish. Right, and us wanting to make progress in a variety of every a variety of areas of our life, whether it's personal or societal, um, it needs to start from a place of once again this open dialogue uh, standpoint of even getting beyond fault, right? Because I think that's something where we talked about even earlier of making mistakes, um, or that's even taking fault, like oh, I'm at fault for this, and by all means, it's important to take responsibility for things. Um, but sometimes we tend to mix those two things up and something may be completely outside of your fault, but may still be within your responsibility to make sure that you make the changes necessary for your betterment or for the betterment of those you care about. Um, so there, there's, a, there's definitely a challenging balance there of having a high level of critical uh, accountability, if you will. Uh, hey, this is not my fault, but hey, it's still my responsibility to make sure that I am educating myself, making sure that I'm thinking before I speak, making sure that I'm being open when I'm going into these difficult conversations, whatever it may be. And once we're able to come from that standpoint and going, okay, what is our all around goal? What are the steps we're going to go into so that we're not just hoping things get better or wishing things get better, but we can actually take uh, 
actual steps to make things better. And once again, opening doors along the way, but not just opening them along the way, but opening them and making sure that people have the accessibility and actual desire to walk through them because we're creating that type of environment, conversation, culture, and experience for people. So um, kind of a lot there, but that, that'd be the kind of two or three biggest pieces I would definitely say. Darrell, and thank you so much for really honing in on that, the idea of naive hope versus like things will just get better and the actual idea of critical hope that there, there's work there's work to be done and we're, we all have a, a, a level of responsibility and accountability with that. Thank you. Anybody else? For I just wanna add that what I've seen, for me to be where I am now, someone had to feed into that. There was hope that I can be a part of that next generation of those leaders that can be in these calls or have those discussions, the hard discussions. And I also see my counterparts probably had someone feed into them that hope that they can be the leaders themselves. And so I know that sometimes it is challenging to see potential that potential hope in the future generation, but we know as well as I do, our journeys were not easy but we navigated it based off of just some one person or several people giving us hope. So while we may find it hard, it's okay to give hope to those that are following us because they could grow into the next leaders that we need to move these discussions forward. That is not without its own um, troubles or challenges, but that hope has to start somewhere and Again, someone fed into us, so I equally see us feeding to others. Um, one thing that I have found that has kept me hopeful is um, recognizing, acknowledging, and some celebrating the small progress. Um, I think that we are we are dealing with a lot right now, and there's a lot of change that we are pushing for, and a lot of it is big change and and drastic change. Um, but I think that what has helped me be hopeful um, is the small change that's happening, you know, in front of me, in my classroom, in my office, in my department that that you can see um, and, and just kind of celebrating that on the way to these bigger, this bigger change that I know we all want to see and that we all have an expectation for. Um, and so that has really helped to keep your spirits up um, because we it's a long road. It's this isn't something that's going to happen overnight. But, you know, I think having those small victories will help you remain optimistic, remain hopeful um, and, and create a, a little bit of joy um, along the way. That was nice to say. I just want to add a quick thing because um, building on that, I really appreciate, Kara, your leadership in facilitating these because it has forced me, uh, I can't speak on behalf of my colleagues here, to pause and reflect as well. And it, it helped me to identify some of those uh, achievements that Anaja just mentioned, that sometimes we don't pause to recognize and celebrate. And it is important to do that because it does give us that energy to, to continue to do more work. So thank you for uh, having this as a series during your, your year of leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stacey. And I, this is what I said, you know, you all, this is inspiring to me. I'll get off this call and my son will be like, why is she so happy? I'm like, oh my gosh, because I just spent time with amazing people. <laughs> I'm inspired. So those pieces of hope, I, I truly, I truly appreciate that. Jake, any last things that you'd like to share? Uh, the only thing I, I was thinking about is is more, uh, you know, allowing allow our students to to share their experiences uh, and and be someone um, that they can rely on and um, and listen to and and that can mentor them through research through uh, through teaching uh, and um, and whatever else they might need. Thank you. I just I just want to acknowledge all of you. I want to acknowledge, you know, your authenticity, your uh, courageousness. We've talked a lot about <laughs> stepping into spaces of uncomfortable, uncomfortable, uncomfortable comfortability and um, this opportunity to be able to, to see these spaces. And 
one of the things I think that I've learned is I've really appreciated people that I've been able to see in spaces be courageous. And I think that's also helped me along my own journey or related to DEI and anti-racist work. And so I just want to say that I appreciate your time today. I'm looking forward. Um, we'll have one more. We'll have one more vlog after this around um, a journey and empowerment. So how we step out of different leadership and empower others to do the work and where we step into other spaces to continue work. And so thank you so much. I just want to remind everybody, you know, that throughout this year and hopefully we continue this after this year, but may we continue to challenge ourselves to listen, learn and do better. And may we inspire each other as we progress forward together as change makers, engaging in critical hope and sustaining hope. But most importantly, let us be the change the world needs to create and sustain healthy communities. So I thank you all so much for your time today and uh, we look forward to the, to the next one and you all have a great day. All right, start spreading and sustaining the hope. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone.